Okay, so part B of the lecture. How does a facility monitor quality? I mean, that's, that's a great saying. We're going to monitor quality, but exactly what does that mean? Well, there's an indicator and there's a metric. And both can be used to monitor quality. An indicator is the item of concern. Hand washing rates, central line infections, falls, major indicator of quality. The metric is the measurement. So the rate of, of central line infections, the percentage of people washing in and washing out, the number of falls in a month, hopefully zero, but we all know that that's not usually the case. So that you have to mo monitor both the indicator and the metric. You can't really do one without the other. <clears throat> and the specific indicator will drive the type of me metric that you'll be doing. Rates and numbers are different. Um, a rate of infection will usually be a percentage, one in whatever. Whereas falls will generally be number of falls. Because it would be very difficult to, to do a rate of falls. I suppose you could do rate of falls per patient stays, but that would be an awkward number to work with. So indicator is what's being measured. The metric is the measurement. So who determines the standards and goals that are to be met? There are a lot of places that tell hospitals and nursing homes what needs to be met. The ANA sets standards of care. Accrediting groups, JCO, Joint Commission, state surveyors set standard of cares. AHRQ it sets clinical practice treatment standards of care. Within each facility, they have a standard of care. Of course, it can't be less than any of these other ones, but they have standards of care. You can compare yourself to your own baseline, which is a very important comparison. So doing that would be not saying my hospital will do better than that hospital, but my hospital will do better than last month or last year. As students, I really like it when students compare themselves to themselves. To pick two people at random, Bozena and Angela, you can compare yourself to each other, but it's an unfair comparison. You are both individual people. Just as Jason and Cammie are, are two different people. You can say, well, I got an A and you got a B, but you don't know the backgrounds. So you can't know if those are actually fair comparisons. What you can do is Katie can say, well, I got an A this semester and a B last semester, so I'm improving. That's a good comparison because any of you can get an A or a B, but there's other things going on. Some of you may be working full time. Some of you may be married with kids at home or grandkids at home or living with your parents or living on your own. Some of you may work as a CNA or an LPN. Some of you may not be working in healthcare. And all of those, all of those components will create your environment. So you need to compare within your environment, which means compare yourself to yourself and no one else. Don't worry about what other people are getting on your grades. Focus on you. But you can compare yourself to peer groups. And this is, when, this is where you open up to the greater environment. So you look at everybody within your graduating class. Don't compare to people that graduated ahead of you. And don't care, compare to people behind you. Don't compare yourself to nurses who have been nurses for 10 years. Not a fair comparison. I compare myself to nurses who have been nurses for 15 to 20 years, but I don't com compare myself to nurses who are nurse practitioners. Not a fair comparison. You can also get standards from literary or published results. So again, go out to, to what are the standards out there? Your hospital can say, what are the standards of, of uh, that have been published for hand washing and we're going to do X percentage better than those published results. So there are many different 
places where standards get applied or get um, uh, taken from, they are all applicable at different types. So how do you measure performance? Uh, now measuring performance, is that going to be a metric or an indicator? If it's measuring, it's a metric. When we're talking about the actual goals, that's an indicator. So how are you going to measure? You could use state reports from the state, the MDS reports, minimum data set reports. You could survey patients. Now, surveying patients has its pros and cons. I'm sure you can probably figure out which is which. What is the, what type of patient are you most likely going to get a response from? When do you do your surveys? Because if you've gone to McDonald's or Walmart or a, or a restaurant or whatever, you may have been given a survey card. If you've been a patient in a hospital, you may, you, you've certainly been given a survey. When are you most likely to fill out that survey? There's two extremes. One, when you're really happy. Two, when you're really unhappy. It's that mid-ground where it's, okay, those people almost never respond. So you get skewed results. You get the people who are really happy, really unhappy. Have you ever shopped on Amazon? I like to shop on Amazon. I'm very good at it, and my wife knows that I'm very good at it. <laughs> That's beside the point. But when I, when I go out there to buy something, when I go out to look for a book or any other device, I look at the reviews. I look at the other consumer reviews. I do not look at five-star reviews, nor do I look at one-star reviews, because those are the people that either really love it or really hate it. I look at the three-star reviews. I want to see what people really think. I want to see people that say, it's good, but. Because you know what, sometimes what, a, what uh, someone else thinks is not a good thing, I don't care. Um, other people may have different, different standards, different indicators. I want to see what their metrics are and what they think because that's going to tell me a much better picture than all five stars or all one stars. We can audit medical records, and that that's a good gives us a good uh, measurement of what's been happening. And you can do a concurrent meta audit review too, which is happening as it goes on. Um, but most often they're they're retrospective, meaning you only find out what happened looking backwards. Helpful, but not to the person in question. It it is helpful going forward. We can review reports, incident reports, infection reports, pharmacy financial utilization reviews. Those are all always going to be retrospective after the fact. When Joint Commission goes into the hospital, they always do tracers. They use the tracer methodology. And man, I tell you what, that is a really, really detailed retrospective review because what they do is they they take their, their number of charts if you've ever been involved you know they take a specific number of charts and they go backwards and they look at every person every department that had contact with that patient and then they investigate and re interview all those people or a significant portion of those people so it could be not doctors and nurses of course it could be housekeepers and dietary aides it could be respiratory therapy radiography PT, OT, everybody. And they, they look and see the entirety of that person's stay. What was their level of care? So it's a very comprehensive review, very detailed. Unfortunately, it's so detailed that they can only usually do a, a small number of reviews. I don't know, I don't know exactly how many they do, but they're, you know, when, when joint is in the hospital, they're usually only in for one or two days. So if they get let's say they do five reviews if they get one that's really bad one in five being bad that's horrible so it's not a nice comprehensive review it doesn't give a good broad scale picture when they find something acceptable or not acceptable they just they're being compared to accepted standards and it could be standards that are that are industry-wide or department-wide 
And that's, well, again, you're comparing the indicators with the metrics that are, that are being used. If something is, is acceptable, what are you going to do? If you look at, let, let's say, um, hand washing is acceptable, let's say it's at, you're at 85%. Now, obviously, perfect would be 100%, but we know that's not going to ever happen. But let's say your facility is 85% and your, your benchmark is 81%. What are you going to do? Slack off a little bit because you have 4% maneuver room? Stay where you are? You could. I mean, you, you've beat your benchmark, so you could stand pat. Or are you going to maybe put your benchmark to 88% and try to improve? That's what the best facilities do. They're never sitting on their benchmarks. They're always bumping them up incrementally to try and get a little bit better outcomes. If your benchmark is 81% and you are at 71%, what are you going to do? Is there a fluke, a, a one-time aberration, or is there a systemic problem? And that's where you really have to look. For example, um, <clears throat> hand washing. Let's just say hand washing. Um, you suddenly have a, a dip. Well, what may have happened to cause that dip? Maybe, if you look at it, you discover the sanitizer was changed to a different, different um, uh, formulation. And that sanitizer burned possible. Some sanitizers can be more um, irritating to others. So your, um, uh, your, your, the, the uh, infection control department may be switched to a new sanitizer because it was less expensive. But because it hurts, people don't use it as often. So that identifies a specific problem. So that would be a, a system cause, a root cause that they chose to make a change and that change results in poor performance. Or it could just be people get sloppy and lazy and that would be an individual cause. Six Sigma, we talked brief briefly, it's a methodology that improves efficiency and capability of processes. It sets goals, uh, commonly it's increased profit or reduced errors. Uh, it devises improved processes that increases um, performance. It, it looks for near zero defects and it assumes the process is the correct thing to do. Almost always the process is the correct thing but sometimes processes can be improved. Now it uses the DM, DMAIC process. We'll talk about each of those letters in great detail coming up right now. The DMAIC, the D is the define phase. And before you can do anything, you have to understand what you want to do. So you define what's going on. You're going to identify the goal, the team leaders, the membership of that team, the responsibilities. You're going to define and set rules of that team. Determine limits or resources, responsibility. This is when you brainstorm ideas and you identify the people who are actually involved. So if it's hand washing, you're going to identify stakeholders, which would be nurses, patients, uh, staff members as a whole. So the D is define. And that's, and that's important for everything because you really want to know what is, what is the goal. You're also going to write a problem statement and the goal statement. Now this may seem like it's a redundancy, but it, you really need to put down on paper what you want to get done. Now remember when we talked early on in the, in the first part of this lecture, we talked about Dr. Berwick where he said that we're going to set, we're going to save 100,000 lives in the next 18 months. That is a specific goal. He wrote it down. He announced it. He also determined the cost of doing nothing, which would be 100,000 more people will die if we do nothing. The next step, the M, is measure. 
we're going to de determine key measurement indicators. The time, the costs, the distance, the numbers. We're going to measure the problem. We're going to find out exactly where the problem is right now. Hand, hand washing is a classic example. I'll keep coming back to that one. So we, you, do, you run a survey and you determine that currently hand washing is at 66% and your goal is 81%. So now we know we have to move 15%. That's one in six. One in six improvement is all we need to do. So we're going to measure the problem. We're going to identify who's responsible for the data collection. and We're going to document everything. The A is the analyze phase. We're going to analyze, we're going to look at the difference between baseline and the data collected. So um, what's, where's the gap, that 15% difference? What's result, you know, measure that gap. So we have one in six, so it's a 15% variable. Don't blame people for, for doing things wrong. Don't say, Susie, you're not washing your hands, because that's not going to help anything. Look for, look for commonalities. Is it a shift? Is it a, a group of staff? Is it a floor? Is it a, um, a department? Look for, look for patterns. Look at the flow. Is it a time of day? Change of shift is a problem. That, that change of shift is always going to be the worst time of any shift. So find out what's going on. Analyze and you know, get some rough ideas. Now we're going to move to the I, the improvement part of the phase. We're going to take steps to make, take steps toward improvement. So we've, in, in the measurement, we've determined 15% that we're under. In the analyze, we've determined that it's a change of shift. So in the improvement phase, how can we address change of shift? How can we make sure that people don't forget to do this fundamental hand washing? In the control phase, this is when we're going to standardize the new process. So we may have decided that a change of shift, we're going to um, change report times so that there's always somebody on the floor so that th nobody feels incredibly rushed. Everybody will feel a little bit rushed, but not horribly rushed. So we're go going to standardize in the, in the C part, it's control. We're going to um, reintroduce education. We're going to continue to uh, break critical links of the old paths. We're going to uh, implement our new plan and continue to measure key performance. This is never a one and done process. You will always be continually evaluating for success. Do, will we get that 15% right away? Probably not. But if you improve by 5%, then you know how, what you have to do to get to the next 5% and the next 5% and until you get to your standard. And then you bump it up a bit. So look at the current systems. How are we going to standardize process? We're going to look to see what's currently being done. Staffing, supplies. Remember, we might move the, hand, the sanitizer inside the room. We might change to a better sanitizing solution. There may be... Um, a computer system. On, on, if, if sometimes some facilities use handheld devices to do their charting. There may be a reminder on there as you as you enter a new room. It'll say, "Have you washed your hands?" A simple reminder like that to keep people on track. You may need a multidisciplinary multidisciplinary approach. In fact, you almost certainly will. If it's something as basic as hand washing, you will need to get every department involved. There, there's a, per, a principle called the Pareto principle, or the 80-20 principle, which says that 80% of problems are caused by 20% of the people or the systems. So standard, standardization does not mean that we're going to have a rigid or arbitrary set of rules. But it does mean that we're going to take into account everything and hold everybody to that standard, understanding that each person may have a different um, underlying base principle. An example, let's say a person is allergic to the alcohol in the alcohol wash. So they're never going to use that alcohol sanitizer, are they? So what, what can we do for that person? Well, 
to take into account, we might have to expand the, the observation to go from not simply sanitizer, not, not simply the waterless sanitizer, but using soap and water too. Because remember, there, there will be times when we have to use soap and water when the person has a C. diff infection, right? If we simply count how many people use sanitizers, if you have a large C. diff outbreak, your numbers are going to be skewed down because they're not using the alcohol sanitizer, they are using the soap and water, hopefully. So again, we have to look at big picture items. What is going on totally? We're going to use evidence-based nursing practice. And this is when nurses make clinical decisions based on best, ev best available research evidence. Research utilization is a similar term. Now, unfortunately, it says that in 2002, re research says that less than 20% of nurses are using, uh, are, are, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Less than 20% of medical practice and even less nursing practice is driven by solid evidence. Less than one in five actions that from doctors and less than that are nurses uh, are using evidence. That's a little scary. So what is preventing barriers to um, adopting evidence-based practice? The single most common barrier to, to using evidence-based practice for nurses, they're relying on what they were taught in nursing school. Almost every nurse simply goes back to what they were taught in their nursing practice. Regardless of how long they've been out of school, they are still doing what they were taught in school, which is good if you've been out of school for six months. If you've been out of school for 20 years, you are still more, more likely following what you were taught in school than what current evidence is showing. That's a problem. Most nurses prefer to read non-research articles. How many times have you read a research article voluntarily? My guess is as an assignment only. Many nurses are uncomfortable with library and search techniques. Research reports can sometimes be awkward to read and difficult to understand. And there's a lack of organizational and cultural support. When was the last time you were on the job and your peer said, hey, I read this really cool research article? Or your manager says, there's a new research article out there I think we should all read. Or when was the last time you were told, hey, why don't you take an hour and just go research some more information? Seriously, on the job, when was the last time somebody said, take an hour or two and not provide patient care, but simply research some new information? My guess is never. So, most common reason is nur nurses do simply rely on what they were taught in nursing school. They don't like reading articles. They're not comfortable searching. They can't really understand them when they read them. And the culture, the nursing culture is focused on doing, not researching. Take care of your patients. Don't worry about reading that book. Take care of your patients. You've got more patients to do work with. There's more people coming in. Do, 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 not learn, learn, learn. Does that make sense? Does it, have you seen that? I'll bet you have. I'll bet. I bet I'm even describing maybe you or me. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not. We are all overworked, overburdened with very little time. But it's important that we start finding the time because nursing and medicine changes so rapidly. When I was a new nurse working in the critical care unit, um, and working with people on ventilators, we were taught to take those little uh, three mil um, saline, TBTs we were called, they were called, I don't remember what, they, what TBT stands for, but it's three mils of saline, and we were taught to um, disconnect the ventilator, squirt that down their tube into their lungs, and then take the um, vacuum tube, <laughs> suck all that, that phlegm and spew them out, and then reconnect them. Because the theory was that the saline thin secretion so it's made it easier to suck out. 
Turns out, the only thing those TBTs do are increase the likelihood of pneumonia. Because actually what's happening is when you squirt that in, it can actually push um, 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 compromised phlegm and sputum that already is contaminated. It can actually push some of that deeper into the lungs. It's still being done. And that was 20 years ago almost. And it's still being done. Because that's what they were taught in nursing school. That's what they've always done. And nobody's actually pushed them to say, here's why you can't do it. It is slowly changing, but not fast enough. Now, evidence-based practice is much more, much more pushed at the, at the um, bachelor's level, at the undergrad level, and master's level. But as, as ADN nurses, you need to understand evidence-based practice too. And I really hope that as ADN nurses, you take your, your knowledge of evidence-based practice and then immediately start working on your bachelor's after graduation or within a year of graduation. Don't wait too long. Um, bachelors are going to be, we've talked about this in, in um, learning plan three, one, one of the ones, how um, soon bachelors will be very important. But you, you need to understand the, the strength of evidence, and you need to understand if you're looking at primary research, evidence summaries, or evidence-based guidelines, because they do have different uh, levels of importance. So I'm going to stop right now. We're going to talk in, at the next section about uh, creating the PICO question and how to determine the best evidence. Stay tuned for more. It's going to only get better. <laughs>